Welcome viewers to the first episode of Beyond Philology in 2024. Uh, we are delighted to have with us Professor Mark Latash. Uh, when you talk about motor control, Professor Mark Latash is probably one of the few names that come into mind. Uh, he has been a very prolific author, written several books in motor control, uh, and the one who uh, translated uh, Bernstein Nikolai Bernstein's text from Russian uh, to English and uh, introduced us to the degrees of freedom problem. Professor Latash is uh, a distinguished professor of kinesiology in the department of uh, kinesiology at uh, Penn State. Uh, and well, uh, what uh, won't suffice to uh, uh, to give justice to what Professor Latash has done in his life uh, regarding motor control. Professor Latash, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so Dr. Akash, uh, we would really like to know, uh, we know very little about you, we know a lot about your work, so it would be great to know a bit about your academic journey, uh, you know, how you came to be where you are, uh, you know, what inspired you for this kind of work, and uh, we'll move from there. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, it hasn't been a very smooth uh, uh, trajectory, I would say, because uh, although from the very beginning I was interested in the human brain and how it works, but then I ended up uh, in in the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, uh, which is m mostly kind of physics and math. But fortunately, they had a major, a very small major, uh, with about eight people per year, uh, produced, which was called Physics of Living Systems. And that was my alma mater. So I did there what would be considered equivalents of bachelor's and master's degree. And during my master's degree, I uh, worked with Victor Gurfinkel, a very well-known neurophysiologist who passed away a few years ago uh, as my main advisor. But my father uh, worked with Nikolai Bernstein. So I have heard about Bernstein and other physiological figures and theories uh, since early childhood. So everything looked smooth, but then our family decided to emigrate and from the Soviet Union and we selected not the best time. So to uh, make the long story short, we got stuck for eight years waiting for permission to emigrate and I was forced to quit the job I had. Not that that was a very exciting position, frankly speaking, it was entry level, whatever. Um, so for the next eight years, on the one hand, uh, one can see them as mm, being not very productive in terms of professional growth, because I had to earn my living being a freelance translator and uh, editor. And during the summer months, I also worked as an archaeologist for several years and loved, by the way, working as an archaeologist. Um, but uh, also during that time, Anatole Feldman, uh, yeah. who became a very close friend and who is very well known in our field, of course, because he started the equilibrium point hypothesis and developed it uh, single handedly, basically. So he uh, invited me because I wasn't doing anything to come to his lab and work with him on a couple of projects. And that was very uh, important for me, very eye opening and also um, getting a new friend and a friend of uh, and Anatole has really become a very close and a very dear friend. Yeah. So we are still in contact and discuss, continue to discuss uh, interesting issues. So that time was not completely lost. And then I got permission to emigrate, came to Chicago, where my brother had been living for a long time at that time. And uh, I joined the group of Jerry Gottlieb. Uh, of course, I came without a PhD because those eight years of being unemployed, basically, uh, at least legally speaking, uh, could not, I could not get uh, any professional yeah. degree. So I came to Jerry. He accepted me into his lab as a graduate student. And simultaneously, they invented for me a position uh, of instructor, surprisingly, in neurosurgery of all possible fields. Yeah. I'm not a medical doctor at all. Uh, but nevertheless, so it somehow worked out, and uh, after two years and a little bit, I defended my doctoral dissertation there, and I stayed at Rush for quite some time. So I would say that was my return to the movement uh, neurophysiology, 
Yeah. Um, now, Mordecai, Mordecai troll uh, to me is still an is an emerging field. Yeah. But there are very few departments that would call themselves motor control. There are mostly departments of human movement science, um, right. I don't know, kinesiology, exercise science, and things like that. Um, but uh, I think that motor control has been developing. So over the past like 20, 20 plus years, yeah. the Society, International Society of Motor Control emerged, the Journal Motor Control, conferences, progress in motor control. So right. a lot of things, books, uh, with motor control explicitly uh, on the title. So I think it has turned into a science uh, of its own. First, so, Natash, would you like to remind the viewers what exactly is the difference between human movement science, kinesiology, and motor control specifically? Because it's very relevant to the discussion moving forward. Uh, well, uh, uh, human movement science and kinesiology are synonyms simply in different languages. So uh, human movement science is any scientific inquiry relevant to human movement. People may be interested in biomechanics uh, only or in uh, metabolism that supports muscle activity or other factors that contribute to it or in the neural control on the, in the neurophysiology. So motor control is kind of a narrow area to me, it is part of natural science, or science is about nature, that tries to figure out how our central nervous system, or in any animal central nervous system, um, interacts with the muscles and the environment to produce functional movements, or dysfunctional movements, for that matter. So for me, yeah. motor control is about the brain. And for me as a physicist, this is a very attractive field because if you deal with such aspects of brain function as memory, emotions, other things, you don't really have good measuring tools. Right. It's very hard to uh, quantify things and to make hypotheses well testable. In motor control, we have a, the very good apparatus of Newtonian mechanics, uh, which allows us to measure, uh, and, and physiological tools, of course, which allows us to measure what the body actually does, at least right. at the level of the output. So it is very attractive to me as to a physicist. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also uh, have worked with you know the pioneers in the field. For instance, uh, Michael Turvey, who recently passed away, you have the translation of uh, Nikolai Bernstein's book with him. So how do you how did you meet uh, Professor uh, Michael Turvey, for instance? Uh, well, uh, I met, uh, so when I came to America, I knew a lot of names uh, of formula and researchers in the field, but I had met only a handful. A handful of those who ventured into the Soviet Union, uh, so in particular Lloyd Partridge, I met Lloyd Partridge personally, but the, the and uh, um, Mori. Uh, Shigemi Mori professor, and Volker Dietz, and a few others who visited Gurfinkel's lab at different times, Francis Lestien. But uh, many of the American researchers, they they didn't come uh, yes. to, the, uh, to the Soviet Union. So when I came to America, it was for me a sequence of discoveries, putting faces and personalities to names on papers. And I was at that time, I already was very much uh, enthousi uh, very enthusiastic about uh, works by Michael Turvey, Peter Kugler, and uh, Scott Kelser. I think uh, these guys really exploded the field from right. inside and changed the paradigm uh, to quite a quite a bit of extent. So I think I came to Turvey. Uh, maybe in uh, 1989 or 1990, I came to the University of Connecticut uh, to one of his seminars and uh, mm -hmm. presented something there, a talk, and so met a lot of his colleagues there. So I think that was the first time we met personally. Right. And at that time, Connecticut was the epicenter of a lot of this work uh, happening in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the second author, which you have worked a lot, is uh, Professor Craig V. Schoner, who had the opportunity to meet at Society for Neuroscience, a very pleasant personality and mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of a genius. 
So how did you uh, start working with him? Well, uh, we met very early, earlier. Uh, I think Gregor came at some point to Chicago and we met there. Uh, or maybe we met before that at one of the meetings, I'm not sure. But it was in the 1980s, at the end of the 1980s. He was uh, a fresh postdoctoral student uh, with Scott Kelsa, and I came as kind of already uh, as, with a name associated with Anatole Feldman. Mm. And Kelsa yeah. and Feldman were always very friendly. Yeah. So Scott Kelsa also played a very big role in the publication of one of our first papers with Anatole Feldman in the West, because he was one of the editors of the Journal of Motor Behavior where uh, that paper was published. So he was very friendly, very supportive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, we met with Shona and it, it somehow immediately clicked. He's yeah. a physicist. Okay, but he's a theoretical physicist. I'm a, more of an experimental physicist, but we still speak the same language. We have the same attitude to the scientific method of how hypotheses should be formulated, how they should be tested. So that, that was perfect understanding uh, from day one. And again, since that time, we collaborated on quite a few things uh, with him. Maybe maybe we could have collaborated on more, yeah. but then we are busy with our own side projects. Uh, and for many years, uh, he was uh, one of the um professors as a professor in germany is a different thing from professor in the united states yeah it's, it's kind of a big name leader of a big research group so well, he was yes. that physician yeah for many many years and so he couldn't find a lot of time uh, to spare for other things but still we we still uh see each other regularly he's a regular participant of the motor control summer schools which i run annually yeah. And uh, and we we are always very happy to discuss new and exciting right. topics. Uh, for the viewers, this uh, I have not been able to go to this uh, summer school yet, but I have colleagues, mm -hmm. um, and these summer schools have been very foundational uh, in make, bringing people together in the field of motor control. Uh, so uh, just for the information. So Professor Latash, whenever we talk about motor control, uh, one thing which comes into mind, especially now, uh, is uh, the work of Nikolai Bernstein. And it seems to be probably he was the first one to uh, to frame the motor control problem in the degrees of freedom perspective. Uh, your work is very uh, is fundamentally driven by that idea, uh, and so is many other people's work. So, would you like to elaborate a little bit on uh, sure. you know what made what made you feel that work is so important that you had to translate it uh, and uh, make it as a foundation? Okay, it's a very it's a very loaded question, and I will try to uh, unpack it uh, step by step. So, uh, Bernstein, now I feel like I really, after translating uh, his books and many of his papers, by the way, as well, I feel like I've really known the person. Because you can follow his line of thinking, his impeccable logic. He was always absolutely perfect. But he quite frequently started with wrong assumptions because he simply didn't know. Okay. So sometimes he would very logically come to wrong conclusions, but we shouldn't hold it against him, of course, because uh, he just didn't know. He didn't have the information which we uh, are lucky to have now. So uh, some of his guesses, however, this may sound like blasphemy, but some of his guesses were wrong and misled the public for many years. Uh, for and instance. I think the so-called pro problem of degrees of freedom is one of those uh, misformulated or ill-posed problems. It is sometimes addressed as an ill-posed problem, but um, all, this were, uh, all these discussions about elimination of degrees of freedom, freezing degrees of freedom, freeing degrees of freedom, it is a juggle, it's juggling with words. It okay. has very little substance in it. The problem is that degree of freedom is not a well-defined construct. And people mean different things under it. Some people mean joint rotations. Other people mean muscle activations. Still yeah. other people mean some kinetic variables. And some people would mean some neural control variables. Right. The intrinsic right. language of the central nervous system. But there is no agreement what this language is. 
I mean, the Lambda model, Feldman's work and its continuation, it offers uh, at least a language in which the central nervous system may be communicating with the world and with, with the rest of the body. So uh, most commonly, Bernstein himself illustrated the problem of degrees of freedom at the kinematic level, like we have many yeah. joint rotations, so we can put a point in space with many configurations uh, of the arm. Uh, yeah, that's very nice, uh, but it's it has anything to do with motor control only if we assume that joint rotations are the language of motor control, that they're right. specified somehow by the brain at some level. But that's yeah. not true, of yeah. course. We know that no, and Bernstein himself knew that kinematic and kinetic variables cannot be prescribed by the brain. He wrote it explicitly because you can never predict the external force field and its possible changes. Uh, can I uh, deviate here a little bit? You said that Bernstein knew this and we all kind of acknowledge this, that this cannot be represented uh, in the brain. Yeah. But we actually have a, have a whole community uh, of neuroscientists, especially the representationalist, uh, where actually these kinematic variables are represented. Uh, 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 and well, there's a... well, variables may be represented at perceptual level or at sensory level. It doesn't contradict anything. But okay. the brain in principle cannot prescribe them. I cannot tell my joint how to move because yeah. if suddenly yeah. my hand uh hits an obstacle the joint trajectory will change instantaneously because of the change in mechanics right but but my brain is still sending signals in order to correct it will take quite a bit of time quite a right. bit of yes. time to wait yes. yeah yes. so this means that the brain cannot prescribe peripheral kinetic or kinematic variables because they all depend on the actual kinematics of the movement and it is never predictable never perfectly predictable yeah and sometimes very imperfect well we should also keep in mind that we have reflex feedbacks in the spinal cord that will also change muscle activations at a very short time delay right. shorter than it needs the signal to get to the brain introduce correction and come back and implement it yes so this means that uh, muscle activations are also cannot be predicted perfectly and cannot be prescribed perfectly by the brain so okay. Uh, okay. at the level, so counting these as degrees of freedom, I mean, yeah. one can do it, but it's not very meaningful from the point of view of control. This is what happens in the periphery. Yes, right. in the periphery, my trajectories may be different, but how much of this difference comes from natural reliability in the external force field or natural reliability in my spinal structures? Yeah. Or is it really variability that's prescribed by the brain? Right. Uh, that, or in some level controlled by the brain. So, for example, my favorite example is that people sometimes consider stiffening muscles yep. as a means to uh, freeze degrees of freedom. So this joint stops moving or moves less. Yeah. Yeah. If you freeze, if you strongly co-contract muscles, the number of apparent degrees of freedom at the joint rotation level will be smaller. But at the level of muscle activations, it will be larger. It will be larger, yes. Yeah. So that's correct. So, so the point is that counting degrees of freedom is a very messy business. First, you have to accept what yeah. level is appropriate for your uh, analysis. If you are dealing with robots, it's a completely different story. Then, yes, of course, you can control individual joint rotations. You have powerful torque motors that act at zero time delay. Right. Uh, the circuits have, de but that's not true for the human body. So uh, the, to me, the correct count of degrees of freedom is the number of independent control variables specified by the brain. But these are not easy to count. Yeah. And I don't think that anybody does it actually in studies. So that's why Bernstein's idea of uh, this the problem of so-called degrees of freedom it is not very well formulated even if in its original form because degrees of freedom are not well defined and you can get absolutely different results depending on what you select to count yeah and then the second part is that he viewed this as a problem that 
it, the way he formulated yeah. that the brain somehow has to solve this problem that there is an infinite number of solutions, but you select only one. Yes. Which one? Yes. Well, it sounds sounds like a problem, but he himself ran a very famous experiment in the end of the 1920s with professional blacksmith who were hitting, hammering the chisel. And he recorded joint trajectories using his Stone Age optotrack or whatever, like, and, okay. and uh, uh, the trajectory of the hammer. And one of the biggest, and really it was a major discovery, that yeah. the trajectory of the hammer was most reproducible. Nothing was perfectly reproduced, although yeah. these were perfectly trained subjects in profession. Yeah. Uh, and uh, logically, the brain cannot send signals to the hammer. It's obvious. No. It can only yes. send signals to muscles. Right. Yes. So how come that the signals to muscles produce variable joint rotations and yes. the trajectory of the hammer remains uh, more or less stereotypical? Not perfectly, but less variable. And right. if he thought a little bit, if he kind of dwelled on that result maybe a little bit longer, he would not formulate the problem of motor control as elimination of redundant degrees of freedom. Apparently, this blacksmith did not eliminate anything. They allowed their joints to move along absolutely variable trajectories, as long as the resultant trajectory of an important object, an implement, the right. hammer, uh, was reproducible. And uh, this result was uh, reproduced quite a few times. There was, I like very much the studies of Pascal Madeleine and his group in the University of Alborg in Denmark. Uh, they studied professional uh, workers, uh, butchers who work on chicken processing factory. So mm -hmm. they yeah. had to work with very sharp knives and yeah. perform a lot of operations every day. And they were kind of stereotypical because yes. they, they did the same things. And uh, he discovered two interesting, well, he uh, the uh, he performed studies in the factory in in real conditions, not in the lab, and he found out that people with more experience had more variability in their joint rotation space than people with less experience. So, with experience comes not selecting optimal trajectory in in your joint space, but facilitating variable trajectories in the joint space. And same as with blacksmith, I assume. Yeah. Uh, he also found out that people who who uh, tried to be perfectionist and always move the same way, they were more likely to develop to develop chronic pain. So variability is good, and the yeah. fact that yeah. we have variable involvement of all the elements, even during the best practice movements, is actually very good. But in a way, it goes against the idea of elimination of degrees of freedom. We don't eliminate them. We use them all the time. We organize them, of course, but we don't eliminate them. Yeah. So uh, that's why co-activation and muscle co-contraction is typical for in extremely unusual conditions or in people with impaired movements. It's a sign of malfunctioning of the system or imperfect functioning of the system not perfect one so this uh right 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 trying to freeze so-called degrees of freedom so uh so i prefer not to use the word uh, the problem of motor redundancy and i wrote a paper about it that it's actually bliss of it's motor bliss. abundance yeah. that yeah. it's not a problem we're using all these degrees of freedom all the time we're not freezing anything it's simply it is a hint right. of how control can be organized or how it is organized. And then it's up yeah. to us to come up with reasonable computational or uh, otherwise other hypo process hypothesis like the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis and its current development by Shona's group uh, was in a way very much in line with the idea of abundance, with the idea that we have a lot of elements and it's luxury. You don't want to throw it away. Okay. So that that does uh, that really nicely explains the degrees of freedom perspective. Uh, but what what exactly is the question then? Like, yeah, we have an abundance of degrees of freedom, and within that abundance, we've tried to find a task solution. 
Mm -hmm. uh, now, what are we trying to understand in terms of uh, well, okay. uh, the brain? Okay. Well, uh, it gives us an opportunity to quantify a very important feature of human movements, which is stability of salient variables. So, uh, movements that are unstable are by definition dysfunctional. Because we can never predict when we walk, for example, we can never predict when we'll step on a pebble or on an uneven yeah. surface. So to think every time that our brain monitors all that stuff in real time and introduces corrections, I don't think anybody even suggests that. Yeah. So this means that the system should be locally stable. Stability is always local, of course. Yeah. So within a certain range of perturbations, it takes care of ensuring that you don't have to correct anything, that it will it will do it on its own. Uh, and uh, in real time. And, um, so the whole idea of degrees of freedom and abundance is that it allows our brain to organize stability of various performance variables, which may be salient for the task uh, we have. Uh, of course, we have a lot of muscles, we have a lot of joints, but the number of tasks we can perform is larger than the number of joints or number of muscles. So in a way, we have a large but limited number of elements that we have to coordinate to perform a seemingly unlimited number of tasks in a seemingly unlimited number of external conditions. Right. Uh, how, we can, how can we do that? Well, we organize them that even in various conditions, the movement is still functional. So salient performance variable remain a degree of stability. So we don't have to monitor them precisely millisecond to millisecond and control them all the time. So I think that's the luxury given by the abundance of degrees of freedom, that in every task we have, I don't know, two variables that are important for our task, but like, well, yeah. I'm uh, when I'm holding an object in my hand, uh, I have five digits and each digit produces six vectors components for, yeah. uh, for force and moment of force so 30. yes uh the number of degree the number of constraints for holding it steady is relatively small these are uh, equations of statics that forces should be balanced moments should right, be balanced right, these right. are result so i i can do what i'm doing now without any troubles like lifting and i i didn't practice it and the phone doesn't drop from my hand yeah. Uh, this simply tells me that uh, I have so many variables, but they're organized in a very flexible way. And now I can do other things and stability is still maintained. So it gives us the luxury of performing like standing. And if we want to do so, kicking a football without falling. Right. Or, so, yeah. So in this well specified problem, it becomes uh, how do we go from these 30 degrees of freedom? Uh, of these force vectors to that, uh, you know, the static stability of that phone in the hand, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the abundance lies. Well, uh, you, it can be viewed as redundancy. You have to find a solution with 30 unknowns, but maybe yeah. only six equations. Right. Uh, it's impossible. So you have to try uh, do some optimization or something else. From the point of view of abundance, uh, you use all 30 variables, you allow them to vary naturally yes. or the way they want. Or if, for example, you, you again, you're holding this object, but you want to do with your index finger something else, you can do it. And yes. you are not uh, losing the balance of, of the phone in hand. So as soon as I remove the index finger, it's a monstrous perturbation for the mechanics, for all the right, equations. Right, right, right. But I don't perceive it like that because I organize my fingers into a single unit for, for the lack of a better word in our lab, we use the jargon term synergy, yeah. but uh, this word has been used in so many meanings that uh, I feel it's jargon, of course. Yeah. But it's a neural organization stabilizing salient performance variables for the task. And right. then we can work within that solution space. We have this huge multi-dimensional solution space uh, for this task. And now we, within that space, we can do other things. We can do other tasks. 
Right. So, so Professor Kash, uh, I mean, this was a very loaded explanation, uh, and we can, you know, kind of dissect it one by one. So, one of the important thing is uh, a direct contradiction to, uh, you know, more computational ideas like, for instance, internal models. Is this perspective of degrees of freedom compatible with the with the internal model hypothesis? Where at the algorithmic level, we are always trying to explain that brain has brain is actually predicting. And it's trying to mismatch from sensory consequences of actions, and based on the error, it is giving corrections. Is that tenable uh, biologically? Well, you know, uh, Rene Descartes many years ago said yeah. that before starting a discussion, we should agree on the meaning of words. Yeah. And a similar statement I heard from Gelfand, completely unrelated to in our face-to-face uh, -face conversation. Once he said. You know what? The worst thing to discuss complex issues is to use hints. Um, okay. So we should be exact with the meaning of words. Yeah. And I cannot be exact with the meaning of uh, the expression internal model. I'm yes. not using this word combination. Other people do. Yeah. I try to get from them an explicit. I uh, I discuss these issues with them quite frequently, yeah. and I try to get from them a definition. Like, you know. if you have a model, it should have an input, it should have an output. So yes. what's the input? What's the output? Uh, and it's virtually impossible to get uh, a, a clear answer. One of my colleagues once told me, oh, it doesn't matter. An internal model can use any input and any output. It is just mapping some input signals on some output signals, and these can be any. Right. But to me, this is a definition of God. Only yeah. God can move, uh, map arbitrary signals to another set so, of arbitrary signals. Right. So if we assume that there is God inside our mind, yeah. we, should, we are not scientists. We should stop. Uh, we should search for another occupation because yeah. we are not trying to find laws of nature that, because God is, a superna is supernatural by definition. Yeah. So... Uh, as soon uh, uh, in my discussions with another very prominent scientist, I once asked him, what do you think is internal model in the brain localized? Because he used that term. Yeah. Or is it distributed? He immediately yeah. said, oh, it's very likely distributed. And then I asked a question. Now, can parts of the external model be outside the central nervous system? For example, in the muscle. He thought a bit longer and said, yes. So, then internal model becomes synonymous with the body. Right. So, we say that the body solves the problem with the help of internal model, which is the body. Uh, right. Then, right. I, uh, I don't see, uh, uh, I don't understand how to continue a discussion. So, yes. if we assume that motor control yeah. or, well, neurophysiology in general, uh, biology in general, is part of natural science. We assume that our bodies and its important parts have not been designed by, an ex by a supreme engineer or programmed by a supreme programmer, right. but they emerged in the natural process of evolution, then they should obey all the laws of nature. Yes. The laws of nature as we know them for inanimate nature, they are very well formulated, at least for uh, large objects, but not extremely large. So. For yeah. anything smaller than the planet and larger than an elementary particle, it's okay. Yeah. It works. And we are somewhere in between. So we should obey those laws. Right. But apparently they're insufficient, these laws. Yeah. So they don't have si they don't have place for such concepts as initiative or activity. Yeah. When action comes from within the body. Yes. Now this is a big challenge. So to me, this is actually the most important uh, challenge in the field of motor control, discovering and formulating laws of nature that are biologically specific or biology specific, that yes. apply only to biological objects and do not apply to other natural objects that exist on the planet. Right. So, yeah. So this brings us to two points. One, one is, your uh, you and you started this uh, conversation with the idea that 
you know, you agreed with uh, Nagashana's, you know, idea of science and hypothesis testing, that you formulate a hypothesis and how you go along with testing it, right? And the way you formulated the degrees of freedom uh, perspective, you have these variables which are part of your hypothesis, that if these are the variables, the, you know, the system is trying to optimize or trying to kind of, uh, you know, find the solution space within, then you can have frameworks like the UCM to test this hypothesis, right? Yeah. And they and they, these kind of hypotheses do not directly come out of uh, more uh, amorphous uh, concepts like the internal model, right? Because there's no specification. Yes. Well, if you take a look at the uh, experimental foundation of the idea of internal models, it's usually quite limited. So or on the one hand, it's usually related to some force variables or maybe muscle activation variables at best. Yeah. So there are no intrinsic variables that may be no. components of these things. But we know that forces and kinematics cannot be prescribed by the brain independently of external conditions. So that's yeah. kind of... Uh, with uh, originally the same problem applied to the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis because the original uh, experimental material was in spaces of kinematic variables like joint rotations or... Uh, kinetic variables or muscle activation variables yes. primarily because these are the only ones that we can measure with sufficient degree of accuracy in real time right the problem with uh, the control variables like lambdas feldman's lambdas or their higher level uh, uh, synonyms or yeah. relatives they yeah. are uh, that we don't have tools to measure them in real time we can have snapshots and we are yes. sometimes using these, but uh, they are very limited in uh, how many tasks and how many studies we can perform uh, yes. using those tools. Um, uh, so we, the first studies that were run uh, by Gregor Sean and John Schultz and then in our lab, um, they were using kinematic, kinetic and electromyographic variables. But I always had in the back of my mind a clear understanding that we are cheating a little bit. Mm. We, these are not the right variables, but unfortunately, yeah. these are the... So we tried to standardize things, like, for example, multi-finger force production. Then uh, nothing moves, uh, at least not explicitly. Of course, muscles bulge, and uh, there are micro-movements always, some kind... And so we can use then forces as kind of reflections of the central commands, more or less uh, with decent approximation. Well, at least not as bad. Yeah. Some movement, some, uh, when our analysis is limited to situation when there is no major uh, movement, like standing person and we can record muscle activations, and then we can analyze them within a relatively short time. So yes, there is sway, there are other things, but they are uh, they are not major. So there are there may be changes in muscle length and reflex contributions. So we don't we don't know, but uh, we assume that they are not very large. They are not defining everything. So we we were trying we, because we understood that uh, our tools were inadequate in a way yeah. to address the problem at the level of control, and that's our the pro uh, what we are interested in. And of course, Sean understands everything very well, same way. And John Schultz understood everything very well. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis has been uh, the main working horse, I would say. It yeah. offered a wonderful toolbox for analysis of stability in multidimensional spaces. And yeah. that uh, I cannot over uh overemphasize how important it was so Professor Tash, before we come to the details of the ucm uh, uh there are two impending questions here first one is regarding the equilibrium point hypothesis and the rc configuration reference configuration is it doesn't it go into the same kind of trap which internal model goes because how does the brain know or the central system central system know you know what would be the configuration and then keep changing and when to change it how to change it this is a very good question uh, and we will get to infinite regress if we try to get to the bottom of this yeah. question. But uh, I'd rather not. So I will explain what, how I mean. 
again, I should quote Gelfand. Yeah. Uh, Gelfand once said that we should uh, delineate the range of problems we're dealing with, define proper variables that are salient, and we should not in this discussion go outside that box. Let's see how the box works, that the box of our problems, of our object of study. So yeah. uh, if our object of study, how the body implements desired movement, we yeah. can use the lambda model and the concept of reference configuration of the body. If our question is, how did I come up with the idea that I now want to point on the tip of my nose? That's a completely different question. It belongs to psychology more than anything else, or psychiatry, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, it probably requires different salient variables uh, to be described. Maybe it is based on similar laws of nature as the implementation of the movement, but maybe not. I don't know. I, we've been always pushed into the psychological part of the story, and I'm very much hesitant to go there because I don't, I really don't know what variables are salient. Yeah. Well, relative phase, which was studied by Kelsey Turvey Kugler and uh, then their students, uh, these are wonderful studies, but uh, the, obviously they are limited. It's not only relative phase that matters during our yeah. everyday movements. I mean, during yeah. cyclical actions, yes, it it matters, yeah. but uh, during everyday movements, maybe not that much. So there are other variables that should uh, take the spot of the reference. Uh, of the relative phase. Uh, so it should be supplemented by something else. And what's more important, we would like to know how it is actually implemented in the body. Yeah. And not only at the behavioral level, because if we only record kinetics and kinematics, and we completely ignore the fact that they cannot be prescribed by the brain, we may be getting into troubles, in particular if this is a real movement. Because right. during real large movement, muscle length changes are large, they happen at large speed, and the reflex contribution cannot be ignored. Yes. So we don't know how much of these uh, now textbook actions, how much of it comes from the brain, how much of it comes from circuitry, spinal circuitry. Yes. Like during the walking, we, have, we know that we have central pattern generators that play a major role in defining the relative motion of the extremities. So if we ask a person to do something with two arms, how much of it comes from the central pattern generator portion and related to locomotion and how much of it comes from uh, the brain, from higher structures? So, so, so yeah, uh -huh. yeah. With, with central pattern generator, are you referring to specific uh you know entities or or the constraints or neurological uh you know associations or uh you know inhibitory or excitatory circuit well, combinations uh, uh central pattern generated for me is a hypothetical neurophysiological structure within the central nervous system that can generate a patent activity without patent input okay so on its own so input can be steady and it generates cyclical activity or pattern some kind. But, but do you, do we have neurophysiological evidence for this? Oh yes, of course. Well, uh, in uh, relatively simple creatures like lamprey, uh, yeah, central pattern lamprey, generators yes. have basically been uh, taken apart into individual neurons and individual synapses. So they know how it is done. In higher level animals, we have only behavioral studies, which are already very old, that animals, yeah. uh, spinalized animals or headless chicken can run and flap wings and spin spinalized animals can locomote. Uh, so uh, their spinal cord can produce cyclical activity. Uh, yeah. So we can assign it to some unknown structure. Nobody knows what it is. Uh, very likely there is more than one. Yeah, and uh, very likely it has something to do with lumbar enlargement and cervical enlargement of the spinal cord, but again we are talking about likely things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, the, so that was the first. And the second question was regarding the RC uh, reference configuration. Uh, when we study, and you talked about this a little bit, you know, real versus lab movement. So lab movements are oftentimes, you know, like small movement, for instance, a person sitting on the you know, chair and moving a manipulandum or, you know, the, the force paradigm. But when you are moving, we do not have that kind of constraints as the whole body. So in that case, uh, have we thought of envisioning what is the reference configuration in any of that uh, situation? Well, I think Feldman uh, answered this question in a pretty much detail in his book that was published like well several years ago, like seven years ago. So mm, where he summarizes his studies uh, of the idea of control with reference body configurations. Reference body configurations make sure that the uh, and their changes that they, in a way, I like uh, this metaphor, Feldman doesn't like it very much, but I like it anyway, that it was uh, invented by Hajan Nasreddin, a famous uh, character of Persian uh, fairy tales, who controlled his... Um, stubborn donkey by putting a carrot in front of the donkey's nose on a stick and then okay. the donkey follow the carrot well we can imagine that the reference coordinate uh, if we for example walk somewhere or we point somewhere that the reference coordinate for my fingertip is this invisible carrot in space that leads me somewhere of course uh, I cannot send signals to my fingertip so I have to move joints then I have to activate muscles so there is a tree of transformations from the relatively low dimensional reference coordinate or reference configuration at the task level. Like for the donkey, it was only one carrot. So three dimensional spot, which moves. Uh, and then how it then translates into multiple small carrots for individual joints, individual muscles, individual digits, if we consider grasping. Uh, and it should be all done in flexible fashion. So we use the abundance. Each of these yeah. tra transformation is abundant in its nature. So the number of reference coordinates at the whole body space may be three-dimensional or close to that. If, if we just want to walk from one spot to another spot uh, in the room. But the number of muscles we uh, involve in this action is two orders or... or, or well, close to two orders of magnitude larger. But if we consider the truly minimalistic elements of contro controllable elements of our body motor units, then this, this is astronomical, this becomes astronomical. So we have this extremely multidimensional spaces at any intermediate levels that participate in, implement, in, implement, in implementing uh, yeah. motor tasks as compared to relatively low dimensional level of control now right. how this is done i do not know and uh, well shona has a very nice scheme which he also tries to map on different neurophysiological structures uh, uh i think the most updated one was in 2019 something like that but maybe he has just recently published something even more updated uh, but that was a very well thought through scheme how relatively low dimensional target he actually starts with target selection with target identification which i would call more psychological than um uh, than motor control yeah um to me motor control starts when i know what i want to do and i simply need to do it to put yeah. into action yeah so um yeah so yeah uh, okay. that's the story it's so, nice. uh, and and just out of my curiosity, you know, I want to ask your opinion about ideas like center of mass. So I personally have had always issues with the idea of center of mass, whether it's a outcome property from the statistics, statistics physics, or it's actually something which brain has, because I don't see any reason why brain should be able to perceive where the center of mass is. It might be a consequence of the whole body moving, but the way we frame our problems that the brain is controlling the center of mass like it's, it's to me it seems like an ill post problem so do you uh... I, I i i would agree i think yeah. that the center of mass is a very useful concept if you want to analyze mechanics of body yeah. movement of course yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh really there are no there is no way 
If you ask any naive person, but who knows what the center of mass is, yeah. please show me where your center of mass is. Well, they will just show where the center of their body is, more or less. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we, we don't have good uh, perception of the center of mass, and I don't think that it's actually relevant. As long as we can organize our control in such a way that we perform the task in a safe and efficient way, that's sufficient. Now, analysis can run using the concept of the center of mass. Yeah, I see. I agree with that, yes. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Latash, then uh, coming to the idea which you, uh, of course, touched a little bit, but we did not, uh, you know, delve much into that, was the physics of living system versus control theory. Uh, you know, basically the laws which are applicable to, uh, you know, life forms uh, and uh, biological movement compared to, you know, artificial movements like robots or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, objects. So where are the there in terms of like, for instance, you have work by Michael Turvey, uh, and Kugler on, you know, information laws or natural laws uh, and how they might be different for organisms. But where do we stand in terms of our understanding of how, what kind of laws there they should be? Do we have any kind of a benchmark idea like when we discover them, like, okay, these are the laws? Well, uh, okay. Now, uh, Turvey and Kugler uh, and Kelso, of course, uh, they addressed this issue at a very, I would say, philosophical level. Yeah. I'm trying to address it at a more physiological level, more tension. So how uh, these laws, how they may be implemented in the body, that's to me a very interesting, well, a central probably question. So what what is a law of nature? Well, let's, let's kind of, yeah. let's start with defining things. The law of nature is a compact expression of our experience with the external world, regularities of our experience with the external world. Like F equals MA, second Newton law, okay? Uh, everybody knows. It has variables and parameters. Yeah. Now, variables and parameters do not necessarily differ in the way whether they change or not. All the parameters are usually viewed as either not changing or changing relatively slowly but it doesn't have to be the case. They can also change. How, however, variables are constrained by the law of nature. Yes. And parameters are free. So uh, force, if you change force acting on the object, F equals MA. You can write MA or AM, it doesn't really matter. So right. mathematically, right. M and A are equivalent. Yes. But they're not equivalent in physics because if you change F, a will change and M will not. Yeah. M will may stay constant, may change if it wants, but that's another story. Right, right, right. But but it is it doesn't uh, it's not constrained by laws of nature. Okay, so now we can get to uh, the point now. How do things move? Because we're interested in movement. How do things move in inanimate nature? Well, they move or a little bit more uh, precisely, they change their motion under the action of forces. Yeah. And that's the only way you can. They can move. And we yes. are not going now to discuss what force is. It's an axiomatic notion. It's not very well defined, but that's all right. Let, let's assume that we know what force is, <clears throat> although we don't. So uh, things move or change movement under the action of forces. Forces are variables. Yeah, force is not correct. Now, what uh, I've kind of summarized out of uh, a lot of experience and also Feldman studies is that human movements are not changed by prescribing forces. They yeah. are changed. They are controlled by changing parameters of relevant laws of nature. So, what's a relevant law of nature? Like in the single muscle control. Uh, within the lambda model. Force is a function, doesn't matter what function, of the difference between muscle length and lambda, the threshold of tonic stretch reflex. We're talking only about active force. Let's forget about small things that can yeah. be easily incorporated, like tendon, connective tissues, and other things. So force 
uh, it is zero when muscle is shorter than its threshold for tonic straight-shift legs, and it is some kind of function. All right, so force is a function of length minus lambda. Wonderful. We have two parameter, uh, one parameter, lambda, and two variables that are important for the muscle, force and length. So if we don't talk about derivatives, we talk about steady states. These two are salient variables that describe our object of interest if it's just one muscle. Force and length. All right. How do we change muscle action? When there are lots of experiments in humans and animals suggesting that you shift lambda. And then you shift the whole dependence of force on muscle length along the length axis by changing lambda. And as a result, depending on external forces, you can have a change in muscle force, a change in muscle length, or both. Uh, quite frequently, quite commonly also, a change in muscle activation level because it changes along the curve. Uh, more or less in parallel with force, but not, necess not exactly. So we have a completely different style of control. We don't, the brain does not control by prescribing forces because it cannot. The body is designed in such a way, and it was clear to Bernstein, and I think now most of my colleagues would agree with that, even if those of them who don't like the equilibrium point hypothesis, they would agree. The, the brain cannot prescribe forces. Which is counter they to emerge. the... Yes. But, yeah. Which is also counter to the whole paradigm that, uh, you know, force field adaptation is one of the, the major paradigms in motor control. Well, force field adaptation was, uh, those experiments were wonderful. I mean, yeah. the original experiments by Shadmir and Musai Valdi, they were yeah. wonderful yeah. experiments. Uh, I, I disagree with the interpretation that yeah. the brain somehow predicts forces and then applies such forces because it cannot be a generalizable conclusion because the brain cannot prescribe forces. For forces. Yeah. They will emerge. If the movement will be slightly different, the forces will change. Yes. So the brain has to operate with something else. It has its own intrinsic language. And its intrinsic language is microvolts or millivolts and seconds and nothing else. There are no newtons in the central nervous system. And yes. No... Yeah. Okay. So that's the question. What kind of millivolts you send to what kind of neural structures to perform the task properly? given the external conditions, or within, accept within acceptable margins. And by the way, I like very much the concept of good enough solutions, which was at some point introduced, I, I believe, by Jerry, got uh, Jerry Loeb first. And uh, I agree, our movements are okay. Good enough, yes. But we're not, not perfection. It's like yeah, satisfying. Yes. The idea of satisfying by of Simon. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so we sell, we are not perfectionists. We send signals that will probably, in 99% cases, will produce the right output, unless something unexpected happens. Then we'll have yeah. to correct. Yeah. Then, but our tool for producing these actions is parameter of the proper law of nature, is lambda. Yeah. So we can say it is parametric control. It's a different style of control. It's not used in robotics, by the way, even in the best robots now, I don't think there are robots that use parametric control. They still use good old yes. uh, force control. So yes. basically, yes. torque control. Uh, right, right. And they, well, you can. You can do that if you have zero time delays in your circuitry and very powerful and uh, torque motors and perfect sensors, which we don't. Perfect. Our yes. sensors are fuzzy and awful. Our muscles are sluggish and awful. And our time delays are disastrous. Yes, uh, yes. But we still function, well, acceptably, I would say. Right. So, uh, you know, that, that's a very, very, very good explanation and, you know, uh, put things in perspective. So, so how does UCM come into play in terms of, and then I will also go into, you know, like I personally have a couple of issues with UCM. I mean, I find some limitations and we'll discuss that. So, uh, so where does UCM come into play, and what exactly uh, is UCM? Just a description of what happens, or it, does it allow us to understand something more than? Uh, uh, well, that? if we had, I would yeah. say uh, the 
the concept of uncontrolled manifold is rather straightforward. Yeah. It is mapping between two spaces, a space of what we call elemental variables, yeah. and they depend on your level of analysis. It can be joint rotations, muscle forces, EMGs, hypothetical control variables, yeah. and the space of performance, what you think is important, salient performance variables. Usually, we assume that the space of elemental variables is higher dimensional which yeah. means that there is an infinite number of solutions, a solution space for any task. So solution space is the UCM, is the uncontrolled manifold. I, I think this label is a little bit misleading, but we already have it, we have to live with it. So uh, the manifold itself is quite well controlled. Yeah, It is, uh, the name reflects the fact that you don't have to control the system as long as you are sitting somewhere within the UCM. Yeah. And as long as solving this task is your only goal in life, other things do not matter. Right. Because uh, we never explore the whole UCM. We never use all the solutions. We use usually quite a limited range within the UCM of those solutions. And one can discuss, uh, it's a separate issue, what defines that range? What defines the location of that range and the size of that range? Yeah. Uh, for the same structure of variance, which is the main uh, UCM outcome variable. So to me, in the best of the worlds, the UCM type of analysis should be done in lambda space or reference coordinate space, okay. which can be analyzed at the level of motor units. They all have their lambdas. Muscles, they all have their lambdas. Joints, they have reciprocal and coactivation commands, which are kind of higher level variables, but also reference coordinates or reflections of reference coordinates, limbs and the whole body. So you select your level of analysis depending on what you want to find out. And you try to find out how these multiple lambdas, it's high dimensional space or RNC commands, how they map on uh, important performance variable. So. Uh, I can uh, do a small demonstration using the same thing. So if, for example, I am asked to press me with my finger and produce a certain level of force, where is my re re reference coordinate for the finger? It's actually very easy to measure here. So as soon as I remove the obstacle, my finger goes to a reference coordinate, to a coordinate where everything is in an equilibrium. That's my reference coordinate where the system is happily in the equilibrium, where it is compatible with the minimal activation of muscles and everything is great. Now I can do the same task, but I will co-activate all the muscles of my arm. Okay? And the finger drops much less. Yeah. So this means that even at the level of reference coordinates, even for this mechanically non-redundant task, produce some level of force with just one effect. Uh, I have abundance at the level of control because I can have higher co-activation and then smaller deviation from the reference coordinate or smaller co-activation co and large deviation from reference yeah. coordinate. Yeah. So it's kind of because my finger has this spring-like properties. I don't like spring analogy, but uh, for simplicity. Uh, then uh, the force will be a function of both distance to the reference coordinate and stiffness-like oh, property of my fingertip, apparent stiffness, we use that term, yeah. uh, because it's not a spring, it's a very complex system, yeah. which is a function of co-activation. Okay, so even for that extremely simple, non-redundant task, you have abundance of control. You can ask a question, uh, does the brain know? If I do this multiple times, am I going to use highly variable reference coordinates and highly variable uh, apparent stiffness values constrained to a solution space for a given force, which is hyperbolic, by the way, but it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Or not? Well, the answer is non-trivial because there is, of course, I can just select one solution and repeat it multiple times. I can be very stereotypical. 
yes. and still be very, very accurate. So I don't have to use the whole range, but people do. People do use the whole range. So this is a rare example when you can use the uncontrolled manifold idea and quantitative apparatus and then uh, map it onto the control with lambdas or with reference coordinates. Is there any publication which actually does this? Oh, a lot, sure. We published maybe, well, yeah. at least a dozen of papers where we explore uh, this. Uh, uh, with we, even, practice, well, right. we did it with fingers. We did it with a whole yeah. hand. And a couple of years ago with my Italian friends, uh, we did it with a whole body. Yeah, I'll, the, I'll add those uh, on the description of the of the podcast as well. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there are probably a dozen of papers if one takes a look. The first ones were uh, the first author was uh, Satyajit Ambike, Ambike, Satya yeah. Ambike uh, who was a postdoc at that time in our group, and he was the leading figure. Uh, but then uh, many other people, Sasha Reshetka did it, and then a few others who worked in our lab. And as I mentioned, most recently it was done with a group of Paolo Cesari and Matteo Bertucco in the University of Verona. Um, yeah. I was there during part of my sabbatical I see. Uh, with them. So yeah, this can be done and it works. The question, it hasn't been yet developed to become a clinical tool. Like we've right. been using the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis for multi-finger analysis of force production and whole yeah. body actions in the muscle space. Uh, we've been using it for studies of patients with a variety of disorders, movement disorders, Parkinson's, stroke, multiple sclerosis, I don't know, quite a bit, cerebellum. Uh, and it's, it seems to be very useful it's in a sense that it's very sensitive. It is subclinical. We yeah. sometimes see changes that clinicians do not see. Yes, uh, and I then, wanted to come to that. Uh, the, the clinical so and, back to the uncontrolled yeah. manifold hypothesis. Yes. Most frequently it is used, well, we're limited by tools, basically. Yeah. So since we don't have tools to measure, now this is a nice example, uh, and you perturb the finger or you perturb the whole body, but you have a whole trial to get just one number, snapshot. Right. It is prohibitive in terms of how much time you can spend. Also, you have just one number. You cannot, using these tools, you cannot study the time evolution of action. Uh, so so oh. that comes to, that comes to you know, one of the key points and the criticism of the UCM, which, will, which I'll leave it for some time. But before that, I want to go to the clinical applications. So you had a talk seven years back, which I saw on YouTube, uh, an hour long uh, talk you gave. And you talked about that you could see clinical defenses across populations, especially in the fourth paradigm. Uh, regarding this approach. So would you talk a little bit about, you know, the applications in the clinical domain and then whether the disease is about uh, the inability to choose these parameters or it's the inability to, once you have a parameter, to actually stabilize that parameter? I think the problem is with stability uh, yeah. of salient performance variables. I, uh, I think that it's uh, it has two parts to it. Uh, we even did, uh, wrote a paper with my clinical colleague, colleague Shumei Huang, uh, that was published in 2015, I believe, where we introduced this concept of a syndrome of impaired control of stability, which has two parts. Part number one, you cannot ensure proper stability of an important variable by co-varying contribution of your elements. So you you don't use flexibility afforded by the design of the body to stabilize something. But you, in a way, you use your hand with force production. I'm just using it because it's a yeah. very easy example. As a fork turned upside down, and then you press with all four up and down. Then any mistake by one finger is not going to be corrected by other fingers because right. they all make mistakes in the same direction. So... Uh, Able body, healthy young people are very good at this task. They use a wide variety of solutions. So if one finger in one trial presses more, other fingers will press less. And there is a whole bunch of uh, covariation happening. Yeah. And the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis gives you a quantitative estimate of that. So that's yeah. one part. The other part is that when you are performing a steady state task, which requires producing some level of 
variable of a variable, important variable. And then at a self-selected time, you change this variable quickly. Yeah. What we found out some already 15 years ago or so is that prior like three, four hundred milliseconds, it's a long time. Before yeah. you start changing your variable, yeah, your index of synergy, your index of stability well, drifts yeah, down. drops. Yes. Yeah, we call it anticipatory synergy adjustments. Uh, and since that time, they were shown in a lot of tasks and uh, a lot of study, including whole body postural tasks. So when we started our uh, clinical studies, our first uh, group was patients with Parkinson's disease in relatively early stage, so stage one and two, and we tested them on drugs, on their perfect drugs. And we asked them to perform a bunch of multi-finger tasks with both hands. And uh, one of the tasks that was most, to our surprise, most uh, eye-opening was produce constant finger, constant force, and then at any time produce a pulse into a target, force pulse into it, and then relax. It's a very easy task. I mean, even a patient can learn it within like two, three, four, five trials. And then we record a bunch of those trials. We align them by the beginning of the force pulse, and then we compute using the uncontrolled manifolds hypothesis framework, we compute the two components of variance in the finger space, uh, along the solution space and orthogonal to that space. And usually the uh, along the solution space, the variance is large and uh, it's small orthogonal to the solution space because it produces an error in performance. So people are very good at putting two lines on the screen on top of each other, basically. All right. So we found out that even in these Parkinson's patients, who, when they were compared to their age match controls, uh, there was a significant drop in the index of stability during steady state, and there was significantly shorter and smaller anticipatory synergy adjustments. And that kind of opened a whole box of questions. Now, are these indices sensitive to drugs? We did on-off drugs. Yes, they're sensitive, both. Are they sensitive to DBS, deep brain stimulation tree? We did DBS. They are sensitive with respect to anticipatory synergy adjustment, but not stability. And that's dangerous because if people start to feel that they can now initiate movements much better, but they're actually as unstable as before, it's yeah. potentially dangerous. Uh, we did it with cerebellar patients, Oliver Pond cerebellar atrophy, well, it's now called multi-system atrophy, and uh, with a very similar result. Multiple sclerosis, these were younger people uh, in their mid-age, uh, and also similar results. And the problem, it was particularly obvious in multiple sclerosis, but in Parkinson's as well. The problem was not that they had too much bad variability, too much variance orthogonal to the UCM. Actually, it was about the same they didn't have enough variance orthogon uh, along the UC. Yeah. The yeah. seemingly irrelevant variance, because variance along the UCM by definition is irrelevant because it doesn't affect performance. Yeah. Um, well, it's very highly relevant. It's like I can walk around the uh, hallway with a cup of coffee in my hand, and I'm not going to spill it despite the fact that I'm kind of uh, experiencing perturbations for the whole body during every step, and maybe I'm turning my head and maybe I'm moving yeah. my arm, I will hold it more or less vertical. And if I have a lot of flexibility, a lot of low stability, reduced stability within the uncontrolled manifold, yeah. that's good. Because then any perturbation is going to yes. be channeled into that yes. suspect. Yes. Yes. And it's not going to affect performance. Right. Badly. Yeah. So the problem in all in most of the patients that we studied, most group where we looked more carefully, was in the amount of variance along the uncontrolled manifold, which was reduced, and then they failed to reduce it further during anticipatory synergy adjustment in preparation to the action. Right. So that's uh, these are the two components, and then when we tested stroke patients, stroke it's ambiguous. The results are quite ambiguous. So John Scholz did such a study 20 years ago with Darcy Raisman, and 
they looked at the kinematic space. Their patients reached to targets in contralesion by the contralesional arm, which is more affected, and by the ipsilesional arm, which is relatively unaffected. And they computed indices of synergies stabilizing trajectory of the hand, and they were the same. Yeah. Although in the contralesional arm clearly moved much worse. Yeah. And with a strange coordination, but the indices of synergy were the same. Yeah. Well, we did now multi-finger studies, and we got the same results. During steady state performance, the indices of synergy in stroke, well, smiled cortical stroke, are unchanged. But anticipatory synergy adjustments are reduced and uh, delayed. So that was uh, unexpected. And to us, a very important part of clinical, or I would say subclinical research, has been uh, a recent study. It's an ongoing study of professional welders, uh, people who are at high risk for Parkinsonism yes. because of the accumulation of metals yeah. uh, in different brain areas. And uh, when we ran the very first kind of pilot study, because it's an epidemiological studies require a lot of patients, a lot of tests. Right. So we ran, from our point of view, we ran a lot, like yeah. 32 or whatever. But from the point of view of epidemiologists, what yes. it was a joke. Yeah. Well, but even in that group, we already saw that some of the indices of synergy control shifted from normal distribution to Parkinson's distribution. They were like halfway there. Hmm. These people were completely healthy. Yeah. They had clean, they went through a neurological examination and had a clean bill of health. So uh, right. from the clinician's point of view, there was nothing wrong with them. Yes, but from the synergy and, point of view of... of uh, they were know, already impaired. Yes. Yeah, they yes. were already imp And our indices also correlated with uh, MRI indices in basal ganglia and also in the red nucleus, more recent studies. Right. right. So uh, that's great. So which yes. means we have a sensitive clinical tool yes. that potentially can be used for early diagnosis yes. or for subclinical subtle changes in the system. So, right. um, yeah. so, 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 which is pretty good because you know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of measures, for instance, you know uh, the amount of movement and and, and different you know uh, linear indexes uh, normally do not differentiate between groups. At least you know uh, at the mild level, you know when you take extreme groups, you can always find differences. But certain differences are actually which have the most prognostic value, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the clinical level. But the, you did mention in that talk about the funding that despite this, you know. Uh, the uh, funding has been uh, challenging. Uh, why do you think that's that's been the case? Because I see that, you know, with my experiences as well, and uh, there's no limit to what we can talk about, like what gets funded, you know, the whole sociology of funding. But why do you think that that's been the case? Well, uh, I'm not in a position to give advice to NIH. First of all, NIH, yes. in, in the past, they funded yes. our lab very yes. well, and we're very grateful for that. And during yes. that time, I also worked on three different study sections, chaired them and uh, kind of paid my dues uh, yeah. in the grant reviewing process. So I know how it is done yeah. firsthand. And uh, the process works, let's yeah. put it that way. But it is controlled by the policies that yeah. are being issued and adjusted by NIH or other go governmental agencies. I don't know. I'm not yeah. uh, involved. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what I feel like in our days, more and more funds are directed at studies that promise a direct clinical impact in a very close future, in very close future. So if you can, so yeah. much of the criticism that we get now and why we're not funded, for example, is that, okay, you will finish this study. So how are we going to treat patients differently? Well, that's the wrong question. To me, I'm not a medical doctor. Yeah. So, uh, so I cannot answer such criticisms. And uh, I feel like, well, if that's the policy, that's the policy. I'm trying to emphasize that my studies are basic research with likely clinical applications. But I'm not offering immediate... And by the way, in NIH general policy, it stated they fund basic research. Yeah. But I would say the emphasis shifts. It's like a pendulum. I remember Jerry Gottlieb's studies were very well funded by NIH. 
they had nothing to do with patients whatsoever. Yeah. And, uh, but these were wonderful studies. Those were fantastic uh, studies. Uh, yeah. And, and that was okay. And, but the same happened with me uh, early in my career when I just moved to Penn State. Actually, my first grant I got before I moved to Penn State when I was still in Chicago. But then uh, over nearly 20 years or close to 20 years, we were funded nonstop. So I cannot really complain. So I yeah. feel like now I'm uh, viewed as an aged, uh, I don't know, grumpy man. And uh, why should we fund aged grumpy men? We should fund young I don't know. Uh, uh, more promising. I, I don't think. I don't think it applies because. Uh, but I sub, well. Yeah, but yeah. I still submit every once yeah. in a while. I still submit applications. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, it's not the experience hasn't been very uh, gratifying yeah. because you you kind of well writing a grant is a useful exercise because you get new yeah. ideas, uh, you get new ideas for new experiments. Uh, the point is that, yeah, you get new ideas, but then you cannot hire anybody to do it with you. Right. Uh, so our lab is now very much downsized. But uh, also the uh, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic gave yes. us a big hit. It kind of coincided with these dwindling funds. And uh, uh, because our lab has always been uh, very welcoming foreign researchers. Yeah. Or visiting scholars and they were a very important source of work in the lab right, right. they would come with their own fellowships quite frequently from their respective countries and everything worked extremely well but then when COVID started it became impossible so and now we're barely trying to restore yes. this flow of uh incoming researchers i, I hope uh, it will become normal again right and and second uh, point you mentioned, and I also wanted to ask you your opinion now here, is like you said that uh, this uh, approach is the only biologically tenable uh, approach to motor control as compared to anything out there. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Uh, just because it takes into account uh, the passive properties of the... No, uh, because it's, it is based on laws of nature. So the if we, if we don't assume that human movements should be studied based on laws of nature. Yeah. Then uh, anything is possible. They can be studied as, I don't know, systems with arbitrary controllers anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but if it is based on laws of nature, we should follow the what's called scientific method, which has been developed in physics very well. Yeah. So we don't need to invent the wheel, in a sense, uh, from scratch. But we should understand that maybe we're dealing with systems where just physics may not be sufficient. We have to supplement it with something biology specific. There, there are, uh, we are not the only ones who are trying moving along this direction. I should mention Carl Friston and his students who are also trying to use the physical method. Of, well, it's somewhat based on, primarily based on ideas from thermodynamics uh about the brain about the brain function i think this is very sophisticated approach it's very sophisticated a very well developed approach uh it's completely different because they are into trying to understand the process of thinking while i'm more trying to understand the process of implementation of thoughts yeah or ideas but uh maybe we will meet somewhere uh, so, uh, and so I would uh, like to now, I mean, ask you a couple of questions about the UCM or, or this compartmentalization of variability, uh, which kind of uh, plagued me. Uh, you know, I have also used UCM in the past, for instance, uh, the work on monkeys, which probably, I guess, you reviewed, uh, you know, from my I understanding, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I know you are very, uh, you know, encouraging with that, despite, you know, uh, mm -hmm. having some uh, issues, you know, uh, I had in the analysis. So, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, one thing is that UCM has uh, these two axes, uh, you know, of uh, two variables, right? Uh, basically, good variability and bad variability. Uh, now, uh, what makes us like like does it have to be two variables, or it can be like three or four or five variables, like good variability, bad variability, very bad variability. 
which we do not yet have statistical means uh, to compute or to put it to that, you know, uh, to partition into those spaces. Okay. Uh, let's kind of make a step backwards. Where did yeah. all this tool come from? Yeah. It came from a very straightforward notion that if you have a system, multi-dimensional system that moves somewhere, yeah. And you observe this system making this movement multiple times. Then you can look in what directions your trajectories converge and in what directions they diverge. Diverge, yeah. Okay. Converging directions by definition are dynamically stable because every trajectory starts from slightly different initial states. Well, if you ask your subject perform, to perform a task multiple times, the initial state is going to differ. Yeah. Also, external forces may not be exactly the same in a, a each and every movement. Right. So, uh, converging trajectories, if you now align them properly in time and you co compute inter-trial variance, it becomes uh, an index of stability. Diverging trajectories, it's index of instability. Actually, both UCM and orthogonal space to UCM are converging trajectories. They're both stable, but to different degrees. Now, the UCM is in the mind of the beholder because yes. you compute it with respect to a variable that you think the system cares about. Yes. Well, unlike principal component analysis and other things which are objective. This is subjective analysis. Right. Uh, which may be viewed as its uh, benefit or not. Uh, to me, it's mostly benefit because uh, you have a tool that allows you to ask the brain of your subject, do you care about this variable? Do you care about that variable? Do you care about that variable? And for each variable in the same space of your elements, you can compute the uncontrolled manifold, perform the computations, and see what you get. With respect to so, which direction is your uh, yeah. variance minimal? So in that case, you can use UCM, according to you, as a search strategy to look for that, to actually identify that variable which well, the system is controlling. But you, you can, it by itself, it doesn't suggest you this variable. Yeah. But if you have candidate variables, that right, you think, exactly. yes. Uh, yes. then you can check it. And uh, the first study is actually with the UCM. The very first study that John Scholz and Gregor Shona ran in Marseille when Schultz visited him. And then it was all started by John Schultz sabbatical because until yeah. that time, we just couldn't find time. So John yeah. Schultz took sabbatical, spent first half of sabbatical in Gregor's lab in Marseille and they did sit to stand. And the second half of sabbatical he spent in my lab at Penn State and we did the pistol shooting, infrared yeah. pistol shooting study. So. In each of those studies, we took the same data and analyzed with respect to different performance variables, yes. which corresponded to different UCMs, which could be a different dimensionality even. Yes. Uh, so uh, to me, that's a very important thing. So I'm not imposing a single solution for my subject. Right. Uh, there is, uh, there have been this, uh, you know what I'll, I have troubles talking without drawing anything. Uh, I will uh, draw something for you in a second. So, for example, you have, and I, I cannot draw anything that's more than two dimensional on a piece of paper. So, let's imagine that you have two elemental variables, and the task is to produce the sum, a constant sum of the two. Yeah. Now, element one, element two. I draw here the uncontrolled manifold. That's the solution space. Along yeah. this line, one plus the other is a constant. Yeah. Now, what the way we normally expect things to happen is that we will, if we ask a person to do it multiple times, we will find a cloud of data points that yes. will look like that. And then right. the variance along the uncontrolled manifold is larger, and we can take different metrics. We right. can take the difference between the two, normalize the ratio between the two, whatever, as yeah. long as you do your statistics properly. Yeah. However, sometimes we see solution spaces that look like that. Clouds of data points that look like that. 
that are right. not exactly along the uncontrolled manifold. But if you yeah. project your data onto the uncontrolled manifold into orthogonal space, you will see the difference. So it will support your hypothesis. But actually, it looks like your two variables are doing something not exactly what you expect. Yeah. Now, this has never been properly merged, these two tools. Yeah. So you can use principal component analysis as kind of a pre hoc to UCM mm -hmm. analysis to see whether your data form ellipses oriented more or less along what you think mm -hmm. or at an angle. And if it is at an angle, maybe it's an important source of information. So that's where the uncontrolled manifold comes from. Now, it only compares, you select a performance variable, you compute it within the uncontrolled manifold and orthogonal. There is no third space. Yeah. You can hardly, there is, I mean, there are only two spaces yeah. embedded into the approach. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, like within the uncontrolled manifold, we did a study many years ago with one of my former grad students, Wei Zhang, when uh, we looked how people uh, who produce total force, how they change finger configurations, finger contributions to force, when they also have to stabilize moment of force mm. with respect to different pivots. Yeah. Now, in the four-dimensional space, force production is associated with three-dimensional uncontrolled manifold solution space. It's a big space. Yeah. Now, if you introduce one more constraints, it's a two-dimensional space, still big. And the question was, will they change? Or will they, or do they not care? I mean, hmm. with respect, and and people do. Yeah, they they do start to uh, move and rotate their data solutions depending on what the secondary constraint uh, on the task is. Yeah. So uh, within the uncontrolled manifold, potentially within the orthogonal space, for example, if the orthogonal space multidimensional, maybe some dimensions are perceived by the actor as more important, and yeah. then it should be the smallest there. While other dimensions are viewed, uh, okay, maybe maybe I can do it. Yeah, I don't think this has been done, uh, but this is uh, a more or less obvious development. So, Professor Latash, then now uh, to the last thing regarding UCM, I'll come to my you know HS of the UCM, uh, and where I find myself, you know, my oh, work kind of no. going into that. Can you hear that? Have your attention, please. May I have your attention, please? We have there fire no alarm. Oh, okay. <laughs> please evacuate the building by the nearest so, exit. So, so should we continue this later? The elevators. It's not going to allow us to talk normally because uh, it usually lasts for five, to five, seven minutes okay. because it's usually not fire, but okay. it is just a warning. Uh, I can pause the uh, recording for some time if, if so you want to. What shall we do? I can pause the recording for five minutes. There has been a fire emergency. I cannot promise, but yeah. let's yeah. stop for now. All right. So, Professor Latash, coming back to the conversation on uh, on variability uh, in UCM. So, this is where my interest comes in. So, the way I see is that there's a lot of uh, structure in variability, which is temporal structure. Which uh, does not, which UCM does not have the capacity to take into account. So within, for instance, the UCM and the bad variability space, you can have a structure of variability, and that might also interact across these two spaces because the way we are partitioning, we are not taking into account a specific sequence. So just like in a DNA, we have bad DNA and good DNA, but at the same time, we have a sequence, and that sequence matters as well uh, for task uh, uh, performance. Uh, do you think? Uh, that UCM, uh, I mean, do you think it's it's a con it's like a methodological convenience, or uh, do you acknowledge that there's more than that which UCM accounts for, and that comes into the realm of something else? For instance, my work with uh, you know long range correlations and multifactorial fluctuations and things like that. Well, uh, the uncontrolled manifold hypothesis has not been developed or rather the, the associated toolboxes they have not been developed to address directly time specific evolutions of stability or stability of the 
Yes. They yes. they are address. We can, you can do uncontrolled manifolds uh, at different slices of your trajectory, and then you will see how stability of action changes, but like a snapshot. Yeah. So, uh, in a snapshot manner. It's not uh, designed to look at long-range correlations or things like that. Yeah. So uh, it's a tool for a specific purpose. It's much more uh, adequate for analysis of steady states because then there are no problems. Uh, when there is a quick action, then uh, we get into the trouble associated uh, with timing errors because and we can never align our trials perfectly, perfectly, perfectly well. And if we have a small timing error, uh, it then multiplies by the rate of change of variables. And if it is large, it can lead a lot of variability that can be structured in any way you wish uh, right. and lead to strange results. Yes. So that has to be done very accurately and taken into consideration. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah. I, I, yeah. So something which I've been trying to model is, for instance, that within your good and bad space, you can have, so for instance, the same amount of good variability in the UCM can have different structures. And they all these, all these different structures can show same kind of UCM stability, but at the same time might uh, reflect a different state, uh, you know, a health state, or might reflect different constraints. They may reflect uh, different ways of reaching the same outcome variables within the UCM analysis. Yes, right. we can get the same results using the UCM analysis, by, and, but they can be produced by different means. But that's the next question, I would say. Uh, yeah. Okay, you know your degree of stability at this point. That's why, for example, we very rarely study, uh, perform this analysis during very fast actions yes. because then uh, an alignment error of five milliseconds can overpower everything uh, and that's not the accuracy we have with natural biological systems so uh, so that's why we are primarily trying to uh, apply to analysis of steady states or preparation to action or ongoing action at a reasonable speed but not very yeah. large we very rarely go at a, to very fast actions uh, because, yes, there is a limitation uh, to the results. Yeah. Right. I see. No, that, that's that's very, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of calming to know. Uh, so, Professor Lanash, uh, you know, we are reaching the end of our, of our conversation today. Uh, but, uh, you know, before we end, a uh, couple of things like, so uh, where do you see you know, the big things in motor control uh, in the near future? Uh, like what would be some of the big questions or big breakthroughs you anticipate to come from? Well, if we, if we are constraining ourselves to the field of motor control, so to the field of executing uh, plans without figuring out where plans came from, then uh, I think we're in a good shape, much better than we were 50 years ago or so. Yeah. Because we do have this idea uh, of parametric. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, noise. Uh, it's not from me now. It's I can't from... hear you actually. So, uh, what about now? Do you have noise? No, I can't Sorry, hear you. Sorry. Just, just a second. Give me, uh, give me a second. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I yeah, hear yeah, it's, very it's, well. It's, it's better now. Yeah, there was some issue. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, so coming back so to the same question. If we're limited to the field of motor control, I think we're in a much better shape now than we were about 50 years ago. Yeah. Because we have a really well-developed theory, and I mean control with reference body configurations, that has good physiological background, a lot of support from physiological studies, and also from behavioral studies. Uh, across population tasks, I don't know if factors, uh, and even species. So uh, that's very encouraging. It's much better than it used to be. 
the idea of parametric control. But the point is that uh, a lot of researchers who work in our field, they be reluctant to take this idea because it's kind of alien. You don't see it in inanimate nature. And so as a result, people are suspicious uh, whether this is some kind of a funky uh, invention uh, by researchers uh, who don't know what they're talking about, although I think that many of them do. Um, so, um, but overall, I think the progress in that field, we should be grateful to Anatole for being so stubborn and uh, uh, convincing and um, uh, it's been quite quite impressive so I would say that uh, now mapping on neurophysiological structures is a big challenge yeah and that I, I don't know if I knew how to do it I would have been doing it already uh, but uh, our brain imaging techniques are so so in terms of their resolution and uh, interpretation of their outcomes the neurophysiological methods such as tms and maybe high density eeg they're all somewhat limited they have their inherent limitations uh, in, in what they can tell us i mean they're good for something but yeah. maybe not not for everything so how really where do these where do these reference coordinates come from where do they where do reference coordinates at the task level are shared across control variables? Like what I showed you now with uh, reference coordinate and co-contraction patterns, yeah. R and C commands. We don't know. Uh, where is the sharing across elements happen? Like if you have not one element, but multiple elements. Yeah. We don't know. We suspect very strongly the subcortical loop through the basal ganglia and through the cerebellum, but that's very general. That's, I would say, yeah. very general. Uh, so now we, in our group, we're very much involved in studies of intramuscle synergies. So synergies in spaces of groups of motor units within a muscle, which we think reflect spinal circuitry and uh, are only under indirect control from supraspinal structures, even in... A, in humans, I mean, uh, uh, what are these? I mean, yep. there are suspicions, reflex loops, uh, recurrent inhibitions, a few other things. But again, this is a little bit of hand waving. So we want to have, so either going into animal models or developing much better tools in humans or something like that. So to me, this is the most important step. And also accepting this whole idea that the way to study biological systems and biological functions is to use the language of laws of nature, not coming up with computational designs or mathematical curve fitting that uh, is not very hard to do. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, and that remains the dominant framework. Some, as a first step, it may be okay because it suggests yeah. to you what can be happening within the system it kind of nudges you in the right direction but it's not it's this is not an acceptable answer by itself right so uh getting more and more people on board who would do more and more studies within this line of, of research and develop to uh, and contribute to the development of new tools uh, and, and do you see that happening uh like do you see a lot of young generations very slowly actually... well i do uh but that's relatively slow because, well, for example, the motor control summer schools that we mentioned uh, briefly is a vehicle to uh, to explain to people that there are these other attitudes to motor control, not necessarily internal models and yeah. or not necessarily biomechanics. And you stop there. There's nothing yeah. wrong with the biomechanics, of course, but it's not about control. Right. Not control theory. And you stop there. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, that there are other attitudes and it's interesting it's exciting uh so yeah more and more groups take it seriously and more and more people but this is hard work right. because you have to really be inventive you have to really invent new things not just apply develop tools now to a new population and get a new paper out right. and then another population or people okay train for one hour or for three hours and you 
these are all kind of uh, factually this is fine i mean if the experiment is performed properly it's going to be useful for something but uh, it doesn't contribute directly to the development of the field so that's one part and the other part is encroaching on territories that are beyond motor control mm. so yeah psychology so that's something that may require the introduction of a new language new variables that go beyond lambdas that go um, well i try to speculate about those things in one of the most irresponsible parts of my books uh, it's uh, the book about physics of action and perception and the last chapter i wrote i'm still not sure whether i should be ashamed of it or not but i definitely allowed myself to to just fantasize without any good reasons for that um and thinking about that we can go into perception we can go into decision making solving problems where uh but we probably won't go all the way up yeah so where does it stop well we wrote a paper with my friend philosopher from our department some time ago uh getting up to ethics uh well, do we need a new language for that or is our language is good enough we simply have to modify it to be applicable to new tasks and problems i don't know but that's to me like slowly moving up uh, along the human hierarchy of cognitive processes um shona is trying uh, that like his target selection model and things like that it's trying to to get to those problems and there are many other of course researchers who try to get there but they usually start from the other side they go from the top and they uh then they don't uh, they don't feel obliged to link themselves to the laws of nature in the inanimate nature yeah because for us for the lambda model physics is the foundation you cannot you cannot avoid it you cannot violate it it, it is a major constraint so laws of inanimate nature they don't prescribe us what we should do but they constrain what we should do and we should keep that in mind always in any models right in the field of psychology usually the experiments are very uh top level kind of, they are uh, yes measuring reaction time measuring eg properties uh but not really connecting much to the substrate so yeah, i think yeah. that's another field another direction right no that 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 was great advice and uh uh professor Latashta, finally uh, uh what is your advice to a young uh, academic uh, trying to build a career you know in uh, with ambitions mm -hmm. in motor control and in general to to understand you know uh, movements and uh, uh movement pathologies uh what should well, be their approach well i have my own bias in that yeah. sense so i have never been thinking about my career yeah it just happened with the progression of my research i will i always entertained my own imagination and try to follow my hunch about what problems are interesting or not uh without thinking uh now what kind of papers and what kind of journals and whether i get a grant or not get a grant of course you have to play by the rules in a way you have to try to fight for grants and to get at least some at least every once in a while um, so it's a balancing act fortunately or unfortunately uh, we are in this real world and we have to somehow select our priorities i know people who start with career priorities what should i do to get tenured or or to get tenure track or to get tenure and that's that's the most important question then i don't think it's one can do that and these people are sometimes doing very good research motivated by other things by career yeah. things and i'm not the one to say that uh, that should not be done so, yeah. so to me it's just one of the attitudes and one of the roots so my personal suggestion what I always tell to my graduate students go with what's interesting 
and then everything else will uh, fall into place uh, by itself. Right. Uh, that's that's been you know my 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 journey. That's why I keep shifting you know my topics of interest every now and then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Professor Akash. This was uh, this was really a wonderful conversation. Uh, we learned a lot. Thank you very much, Mat yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for spending yeah. a couple of yeah. hours chatting. Yes, I we definitely it. have a lot more to ask you, and hopefully, we'll have you uh, again with much deeper questions uh, related to motor control. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Yeah, bye.